If you are watching it from 2199, this is about how the matrix started for us. There is a startup in Australia who are actually growing live human neurons and then integrating it in a traditional computer chips in order to advance AI. Seriously, this is the closest thing to the matrix I've ever seen. What happens when you put a biological brain in a computer chip? Let's find out. In designing modern AI chips, we drive a lot of inspiration from human's brain. We are trying to replicate it in silicon, to replicate it architecture and computing schemes, and finally to fill it in with mind. Kotika Labs, a startup based in Australia, is building so-called dish brain chip. They grow a group of neurons, so brain cells, in the lab and then they incorporate it into a computer chip. And it works, because both computer chips and neurons communicate with electrical pulses. I'm not sure if you've heard about the matrix, but the original pitch for it was that people were being used as computers by the machines. What we're doing is closer to the spirit of the matrix than the original movie. The major advantage of this approach is that neurons can actually think on its own. They can change its shape, grow, replicate, or even die in response to the demand of the system. At first, Cortical Labs use neurons from mouse embryos, but right now they are using only human neurons in their chip. We did find that the cells from people had a 30% increase in learning rate compared to mouse cells. Good news, there is no brain invasion required. Cortical Lab team grows neurons artificially, but they turn out to be the same as neurons were taken from our gray matter. How do they do it? They can morph human skin cells back into stem cells and then make them grow into actual human neurons. Now, how do neurons and tech connect. The chip is actually a metal oxide chip with a matrix of tiny microscopic electrodes, each about 17 micrometers apart. They basically grow cells in contact with this grid, so the cells develop on top of it. These electrodes are used to stimulate neurons, so to send the input and read the output when neurons fire. And then you have an interface connecting dish brain to FPGA. Yes, yeah, so at the moment we're using the implant chips, which enable us to do some of the stimulations and recordings of the electrodes. And then we interface this with the FPGA. So the FPGA is currently used to get data out in real time from the system. So what we do is that we're using some chips from Intan to essentially do a digital to analog conversion from what the neurons are doing into digital values that the computer can understand. And then we use an FPGA to clock those values. So we're reading electrodes at the correct times. Neurons are simulated with very faint electrical signal in the range of microvolts. So very slight change in the voltage. As neurons are actually alive, you need a life-supporting system for them. So basically you need to feed them, which means any device that will use cortical labs technology will need refills of nutrient-rich material. Just imagine one day having an excuse like, sorry guys, I have to go home because I have to feed my computer. The company's first proof of concept is to train the human cells in a dish to play Pong. The reason why we picked Pong was because it was a it was a fairly <clears throat> arbitrary game that is easy to see. It's not that we expect the neurons to only be playing Pong, it was just that this was a game that you could, everybody knows what it is. These neurons are actually live in the game, where they're constantly stimulated. 
Every time the bow reaches the go area, we give the neurons a reward or punishment stimulus based on whether the pato intercepted or missed a bow. This happens roughly once every two seconds. Uh, so in terms of uh, gameplay, what we do is that we feed in the state of the game. And then after a certain length of time, if the neurons don't do what we want them to do, which is in this case, move the paddle to intercept the bow, then we punish them in some way. Uh, the most efficient way of punishing them is, um, surprisingly enough, just silence. So we essentially just cut them off completely from the game world. We just put them in a dark room if they completely misbehave and don't act the way we want them to do. And then the next time we find that there is actually an improvement of the play. This chip, this biochip, is actually based on the Carl Freestan free energy principle, which comes from neuroscience and actually explains how our life and how our brain actually works. It says that any living system is working on maximizing the evidence of its own existence and minimizing the variation of free energy, which means it's trying to minimize the surprise. How to minimize the surprise? You have to make better predictions or you have to act on the environment and make it to fit to your predictions, right? In this particular case, neurons are building the model of the world. In this case, it is the pawn game, right? And then they're adjusting this model based on the feedback they get in order to minimize the surprise. The novel thing we showed was that neurons self-organize themselves in such a way as to avoid punishment and maximize reward. And they do this using both short-term and long-term memory. And this compute is being powered by neurons. So it actually uses just the tiny fraction of power it would require running on a traditional computer chip. Just think about it. The human brain has 85 billion neurons and our level of intelligence runs on only about 20 watts of power, which is enough just to light a bulb. The energy that neurons use comes from essentially sugar water. And the majority of energy consumed by the system is from the computer we use to decode the signals. The measure of efficiency that makes sense for our system is sample efficiency. That's basically a measure of how much training an agent or algorithm needs to improve its performance. And we found that neurons are much more sample efficient than most machine learning algorithms. So the simplest way to talk about how efficient the system is, is just in terms of simulating a neuron. We obviously have a one-to-one -one mapping between a neuron and a neuron. So in terms of that, our system beats the pants off any artificial neuron network. Um, in terms of actually learning tasks, uh, we're about between a thousand to a million times more efficient in terms of uh, power consumption compared to a regular neural network when it comes to learning something like Pong. This is just back of the envelope calculations we did. One of the key advantages of this technology that it is enabling or it's capable of fluid intelligence meaning that live neurons can manipulate with different types of novel information in real time. So they can organize and restructure themselves. And this is essential for applications like robotics. Robots operate in highly variable environments where they always have to model the world around and also learn to change themselves to the needs of humans, right? A robot is certainly one application we are looking into, but any application where training data is difficult or expensive to obtain is a good fit. For example, um, real-time stock trading data. Another application we've recently looked at is to test the psychoactive effects of drugs on neurons developed from a specific person. So for example, if there are two possible drugs which can be prescribed to a patient, we can then test both drugs in dish brain, and whichever one has the smaller effect compared to the case where there are no drugs would be the preferable one. It also fits to a wide range of AGI applications due to its low power. And potentially, it can be scaled up to data centers technology. There are two main ways in which we can scale the system. The first is by growing more neurons per well, essentially making the thin film of neurons thicker going from a 2D structure to the 3D structure. 
Second is connecting the raw output of one dish as the raw input of another, building artificial axons between these groups of cells, similar to how there are different brain regions specializing in different tasks. The biggest bottleneck to scaling to the size of a warehouse will be contamination. Growing neurons without an immune system means that any bacteria that get in will kill the neurons on the chip. These are the same type of challenges that the culture meat industry deals with. So once we get to that scale, we will be able to adapt best practices. And the obvious question here, is it ethical to use live neurons, so human's brain, for compute power? You know, as any technology, there are different applications. So as we said, you know, some for computing, um, drug testing, etc. And I guess it comes down to, as I said, intention and what we use them for and how these are supported, whether it is by legislation, policies, etc. And I guess one of the things that many people are afraid of is, you know, are we causing harm to those entities, right? The actual numbers of cells that we're dealing with right now, there is zero chance of them developing any sort of of uh, higher order thoughts or feelings or anything other than just um, what any insect would do. In terms of the number of cells that we're talking mm -hmm. about, the systems are far too primitive for them to develop some form of intelligence where we don't notice, which is the sci-fi sort of horror that we always think about, that we leave the thing in a jar overnight and then over the weekend it develops, it develops sentience and either takes over the world or we're, um, we're torturing it by accident and don't notice. But with the numbers of neurons that we're looking at, that is not going to happen. No, no, no. And then also in terms of organization, uh, these are just, you know, simple cells. Uh, so for, you know, for a human brain, you don't have just one cell type. You have several and they're organized in specific ways and structures. Um, so yeah, yeah, no, the, these are very simple, very, very simple systems at this stage. Yeah. But they're still very valid questions, I guess, for the future generations, right? And what we're leaving for them, I guess. Cortical Collapse definitely working on a very exciting research. And I would like to know where they will get in five to ten years from now. Definitely worth watching them. Eventually, this biotech can unlock the holy grail of AI research, which is artificial general intelligence. A constant question. What if consciousness is just a computer simulation running off the electrical impulses in our brain. Then we are on the track creating simulation inside of simulation. I don't think a system as complicated as the matrix would ever be realized in the real world. Complex systems become unstable and crash far too often for something as big as a simulation of the whole world to run there for years and decades on end. We can't even keep something as simple as AWS, well, comparatively simple to the Matrix, running for a decade without major outages happening. And if the world crashed, then we would have noticed by now. But I do think that isolated and immersive virtual reality systems, which simulate the real world, will eventually happen. Make sure to share this video with your friends. If you want to support me creating these tech videos, the link to the Patreon is in the description below. Or you can become a member, so join this channel. Now you may like to watch another video about new neuromorphic chip, which replicates the architecture and the computing schemes of our brain. I will link it here. See you in the next video. Ciao!